Let's go. I gotta get started. Okay, let's all prepare ourselves in our usual fashion. We'll have a few moments of silent prayer. The option of rebound if necessary. Oh, before we pray, I have to give you the date. Because that's when people go to our, when we put it on, and they don't know what message it is. That's why I give the date every time the first time, so they'll know they're on the right one. So today is October the 8th, 2019. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us another day. We don't ever want to take for granted your love and your grace, your provision, your protection, all the things that you do for us. We are so thankful, especially that we can be here as a royal family and study your mighty word this evening. So we pray that you'll help us to focus and concentrate. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is my little post-it note. There's some things I wanted to tell you, and this is how I remember. It's been weeks that I could have told you, but I finally made a note. Remember when I was telling you about the thing that we saw on TV, some of us did, about the woman officer in Dallas that shot and murdered a man by mistake, <clears throat> and his brother in the courtroom uh, forgave her and said that he wishes only the best for her, asked if he could hug her. But he also, in an attempt to give the gospel, he said, and uh, it's my desire that Jesus would come into your life, which poses as the gospel for a lot of people. But anyway, um, I didn't tell you the rest of the story. I found out later that uh, he went up and hugged her. He had forgiven her. The judge went to her quarters and got uh, her own personal Bible, brought it out to her, and she had highlighted John 3.16, and she gave that Bible to this woman that was convicted of 10 years. She won't spend anywhere near that, but they, it was uh, uh, something that was negligent on her part. So anyway, uh, and she said, I want you to read this verse at least once a day for at least a month. And so that's the rest of the story on that. So there's a good chance that this officer, if she was not a believer before, might become a believer, but it won't be because of the pseudo-gospel she heard. And I was in the presence of uh, several pastors. I'm talking about ice pastors, great pastors, and someone was telling the story about this, about how what a wonderful thing it was that this guy did, and I agree. Uh, it was people were shocked because you don't see that on TV. But I was also shocked because not one of these pastors said anything about the false gospel that he gave. I, I, I don't know what you would say false, maybe just the negligent gospel he gave because it wasn't the gospel. And I was surprised. You would think all these pastors would at least recognize that out of everything that happened, he had a good attitude. He was Christian-like, but the most important thing he could possibly do was at least get the gospel right and use at least the term believe, which he did not use. And so I was a little surprised at that. That I was, And I, I didn't say anything. They didn't ask me anything. So I just thought to myself, wow, nobody brought that up. But it, to me, that was the, the teaching thing out of a whole, whole incident. And so, anyway, I, that's another thing I was going to tell you. And then I was going to tell you, um, sometimes I go out in the barn and I turn the radio on. It's old, rusty, dusty radio. And it's on to, uh, what is it, KTEX 101? 10, no, 601 or 101, something like that. Anyway, I was thinking about the songs that they play. This is a country western station. And I do not like the modern country western at all. And I don't know how it is edifying to anyone. This is, uh, this, this is a line out of one of the songs. Usually they go, it's, and then they have the electric guitars come in, you can't hear anything. But you know, our young men should be taught that as a husband, you're the head of the house, you're responsible for that house. 
And you have to, to be a leader in love. And that you are dependent upon God for provision of everything in your life. That's what the song should be sending that message, at least to a degree. This is how far they are from it. This song, I don't even know the name of it, but this one part of it I wrote down so I would remember it. Uh, this guy has, the, the woman has left him. They broke up or something. He's talking about, uh, he says, I'm so, no, he says, yeah, I'm so poor, so pour me more. And, and then he makes something about, he, want, he wants whiskey glasses and he's seeing the world through whiskey glasses. It's something, but that's not the worst, here's the worst part. I'm going to say it just like, I'm not going to sing it because it's not hardly a, 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 the singing part, but it's kind of like a singing part, but this is how it goes. Line them up, line them up, line them up, knock them back, knock them back, knock them back, knock them back, fill them up, fill them up, fill them up, fill them up. If she ain't ever coming back. <laughs> do y'all, y'all do know what knock them back means, don't you? <laughs> like this? I mean, and that pretty much is the, Norm for the songs that come over that. And every once in a while they have a good one, but it's not like it used to be when God Strait and um, some of the others were singing. It might be the same song that he had a lot of lines in it like that. Okay, now I got that out of the way. I don't have to worry about trying to remember them. I can throw this away. Okay, I'm going to start with a... Um, an article, it's not very long, but it caught my attention. And even the title should catch your attention to some degree because you will never see this on TV. I haven't. I don't think it will get on TV. I got it off the Internet, and you will find a lot of things on the Internet that the mainstream media buries. We'll never see the light of day, and this is one of them. Here's the title. Hundreds of youth trans, talk about transgenders, hundreds of youth trans people seeking help to return to original sex. Their dysphoria hasn't been, re, hasn't been relieved. They don't feel better for it. That's the, the other title. Transgenders, by the hundreds are fed up with their lifestyle choice and are wanting to return to their lives as their birth gender, prompting the creation of an advocacy network to help them, according to a new report from the Christian Institute. It is Charlie Evans, who was born female but lived as a man for nearly a decade, who just last year accepted her true sex and went public. So many people similarly situated contacted her by the hundreds, so she launched the Detransition Advocacy Network, which is providing help to those who want to live lives as their birth sex. Yeah, I didn't know there was that many who had been, become transgender. Certainly didn't know that there was hundreds that wanted to uh, get back to their birth sex and and. No one was there. They had no one to help them, to encourage them, to counsel them or anything. But this article was in, uh, I believe it was in, uh, what's it, uh, I can't think of, uh, World Net Daily, I believe. Um, according to an institute report, Evan said, I'm in communication with 19 and 20 year olds who have had full gender reassignment surgery, who wish they hadn't, and their dysphoria hasn't been relieved, they don't feel better for it. Sky News reported it has, it had discussed the program with Ruby and explained she started identifying as a boy at 13. She says at the time she had an eating disorder, which she feels was closely linked to her desire to, to change sex, but that was but that, this was not explored by her doctors in the, in the report. When I was at my 
gender clinic to get referred for hormones, we had a session where I went over my mental health issues and I told them about my eating disorder and they didn't suggest that that, that could, be, could uh, maybe be connected with my gender dysphoria. She said surgery was under consideration for her when she went through another thought process. I didn't think any change was going to be enough in the end and I thought it was better to work on changing how I felt about myself than changing my body. Ha, huh, good for her. She said the quick fix being offered to trouble youth these days isn't right. For everyone who has gender dysphoria, whether they are trans or not, I want there to be more options for us because I think there's a system of saying, okay, here's your hormones, here's your surgery, off you go. I don't think that's helpful for anyone. The report said there currently is no data to show those who want to flee the transgender lifestyle. The Travis Stock and Portman National Health Service offers gender identity services for children under 18 with some patients as young as four years old. Sky News reported they now have a record number of referrals. Listen to this. 3,200% more than patient, patients they had 10 years ago. That's percent. They now have 3,200 more patients than they had 10 years ago, with the increase for girls up by 5,337%. Now, I want to tell you, it didn't have this in the article, but what it doesn't say is that in California some other states, it's a, it's a, if you try to counsel or work with these people, uh, you're breaking the law and you can go to prison for that. They won't allow that to happen. California is one, I think also maybe uh, Oregon, Washington State. Only weeks ago, Stella wrote at the Federalist about Walt Heyer's newest project. It's called Trans Life Survivors. Heyer explains that chain sex surgically and lived as a woman for nearly a decade. He later obtained therapy that helped him recognize trauma during his childhood. In other words, he found out that's what the issue was, which left him behind a condition known as dissociative identity disorder. Understanding that, the report explains, his gender dysphoria simply vanished. His life as a woman all amounted to an attempt to escape reality. In other words, he didn't have to do that. He regretted not only his surgically changed body, but the estrangement from his wife and children. He, his book, then, is not a personal story, but a compilation of stories from those trapped in transmania, he said. They specifically sought out Walt to get some much-needed support. They've shared their lonely, surreal experiences, falling down the trans rabbit hole, hoping to escape as he did. And that's the end of it. So I had no idea that that was happening, and most people won't know because you will not see that on the mainstream media, I can assure you. However, um, I thought y'all might want to know that. This is informative, I would think, because did any of you know that that was going on? I didn't know until I saw that article, which I thought was good. Okay, let's get to cracking. Let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 14. What? 172. Mm-hmm. This is 172, Philippians 4, 14. Of course, we just finished with first, I mean, uh, Philippians 4, 13, which says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Some translation says, through Christ who strengthens me. And that was the culmination of about mm, seven verses. And that was in context with that as well. 
So we start out by recognizing that the next five verses have to do with, fin with the financial gift from the Philippi uh, Philippians to Paul for his support. That's what the next five verses have to do is with giving support. So we start with Philippians 4.14, Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Now I'm going to answer why he said that at this particular juncture it makes sense and shows his thoughtfulness as well. The Philippians could have concluded since Paul could live just as well in poverty as in prosperity, which he made very clear in verse 12, perhaps the money they sent to him wasn't appreciated because he's telling them it doesn't matter what condition I'm in, I'm, I'm absolutely content. And that doesn't sound like very much gratitude for the trouble they went to to put together a financial gift and sending it to him through Epaphroditus. No doubt Paul added this word of clarification, <clears throat> excuse me, so the Philippians would not think he was being ungrateful for their most recent monetary gift. We had touched on that a little bit earlier. The fact that he cleared up what could have been a misunderstanding is an example of the love and the thoughtfulness he had towards the people who he had already, who had already benefited so much from him. And this, this gives us a, a motivation that we should have. Anytime that there is something said or there is something that goes down and it could be taken in a way that maybe you're not grateful, you weren't appreciative. We should always make sure, make it a point, that we clear that up and let them know that you do appreciate it. Sometimes we might make the assumption, well, yeah, they know I pre I, that I'm grateful. Don't ever make that assumption. I don't care what a wonderful person you are, and you always stay thankful, you have great manners, but... It only takes one time for someone to misunderstand something and it, and it impacts us. Doesn't it impact you when you go out of your way to help someone and there's no gratitude? Gratitude is a huge indicator of where you are in your soul because arrogant people aren't, uh, don't, aren't uh, thankful. They don't have gratitude. But sometimes it can slip our mind. And <clears throat> many times, well, maybe not many times, but sometimes, Someone will do something for me, and it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how small or how large. That doesn't have anything to do with it. The fact is that someone went out of their way to do something for you, and we should have gratitude. And I have called people before, and I have said, you know, I don't remember if I th thanked you for that, but I want to make sure that you know I'm grateful. I'm telling you that now. If I said it before... Fine, that's fine, but I want you to know. We should go to that further step to do it. Because that other person is never going to say, well, <laughs> boy, I thought you were you know, a grateful person. You didn't say a word. Well, there are times when we forget. I bet every one of us here have received something that was really kind and gracious, and yet in, in the, the rush of everything, we just forgot to thank them. I think it's important enough to call them, email them, if you have to walk to their house, whatever it is, they will appreciate the fact that you've gone to that length to make sure that they know that you appreciate what you have done for it, what they have done for you. I just thought I would throw that out because we can rationalize it very, very easily. And I, I have, I have thought about, uh, in the past, uh, uh, there's been times when People didn't say thank you. And these, uh, these aren't the kind of people that this is the norm from. I've had people who uh, would owe me money, and, and I never received it. And, I mean, not great big sums of money, but just, you know, just enough to pay it back. They never paid it back, and I never mentioned it, because I have done the same thing, I'm sure, somewhere along the line. And, and I don't, it, that would make the money the issue. And they're not that kind of person. So I never mentioned it, but you know what? I never forgot it. I, I don't purposely remember it. I don't think about it. 
But it's in my memory banks, and, it, and that has stayed there. But if this person remembered maybe a week later after the event and said, you know, I don't remember if I thanked you. Did I thank you? Something along those lines. Then you can clear it up. That's how important I think it is to show gratitude to other people. They won't tell you. This group, I don't know if anybody in this group, and probably those that are live streaming and all, would make it a point to go up, well, I gave you such and such last month, and you didn't say a word. I mean, that's kind of tacky, isn't it? Kind of uh, banal. It's, uh, we, 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 you, I think more highly of you than doing that. But I also know that you probably didn't forget it, and you might not ever forget it. And you're not judging that person. What, what I am saying is that we need to ride herd on our own soul, and when we see a chink in our armor like that, we need to remedy it. We need to take care of that to make sure it's covered. And the person will appreciate it, and it will make you feel better as well. So the fact that he cleared up what could have been a misunderstanding is an example of the love and thoughtfulness he had towards the people who had already benefited so much from him. It didn't matter how much they benefited from him. He was wanting to make sure that, he, that they knew that he appreciated what they did. No matter how much they had benefited, the, this whole group would still be on the way to the lake of fire had it not been for God that led Paul to this particular area, gave him the gospel. He was their spiritual father in that sense. And then he taught them doctrine. It, even that, he could have said, well, I've done so much for him, I, you know, that's, that's enough. No. He made an, a, a point to make this an issue so they wouldn't misunderstand or misconstrue this. Most of us have only a very few true friends who will stick with us through thick and thin. When we find ourselves in need, especially financial need, we notice that in quotation marks, friends that used to hang out with us seem to be missing. True friends are like the Philippians who were willing and eager to share what they had with Paul when he needed help. And true friends will do that. They care for you. You see, sharing is not just sharing what you have financially, which we all should do for each other as much as we can, but it's also sharing the need and the problems and the woes of other believers, especially our friends, that we share that with them. Sometimes we might not be in a position where we can help them hardly at all. We can pray for them. We can try to encourage them. But we can't help them with what they need. But the fact that we care enough and we talk to them about it and we're trying to do whatever we can, that's a boost in itself. And so when, when we have a friend that's down and in, in need, we should go to their aid, whatever. I know that I've, I know that you're like that because I see emails that you have sent to people. I've talked to people that you are, whatever I can do. And thus, we don't want that to be construed as just like, um, in the, if you have a certain word process or a certain program, you, you can type something in there and it'll fill in the rest. And we don't want, we don't want to be the type that says, if there's anything and then it'll finish it for you, I can do, uh, you know, finish that sentence for you. I'll do anything you want me to, uh, anything I can do, something like that. We don't want it to be taken like that and we don't want to put it out there like that. We want them to know this is true. If you will call me at three in the morning and you need help, hey, I'm on my way. That should be our attitude. That is what Paul is presenting to us here made it a point for them not to get their feelings hurt, and there was no misunderstanding about it. Helping others who are in financial need takes discernment. Some people think you owe them something and are not grateful for your help, and others will very quickly become dependent on you rather than the Lord to provide a way out of their financial problems. And so we kind of walk a tightrope there. 
Some of them, that, that you, you give them, you, whatever it may be, whether it's your time, your money, or actually something, some overt thing, and they don't care. They think that they have the attitude that you owe it to me. And then the other type is, oh, well, this is an easy mark. Why should I, first of all, go to the Lord and ask him to provide a way out and help me to dig my way out of this when I have an easy mark here? All I have to do is go to them every time and they're going to take care of it. We have to have discernment in either one of those cases, depending on the circumstances, there is the time to say, well, I think it's time for you to rely on the Lord because you can be enabling people like that. And we're all old enough, most of us, we've been through this type of thing, you know what I'm talking about. So it takes discernment. You don't want to be taken advantage of because you're not helping people like that. You're enabling them. Okay, we have the word share here. You see I have it in red up here. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me. So the word share here is sun koneo, S-U-N-K-O-I-N-O-N-E-O, sun koneo, and it is a participle, it's an aorist active participle. Aorist tense, and upon a time we share. Active voice, we are the one that does the sharing. It's the, the BDAG definition is, it's the first one, to be associated with someone in some activity, be connected to, communicate with, or fellowship with. It comes from two words. It's a compound word. Sun is S-U-N. It means with. And koinoneo, that should be familiar with some of you, means fellowship. So sharing fellowship means what I was describing earlier. You want to fellowship with someone when they're in need. If you're a true friend, you'll do that. If you're not, then you're going to kind of back away for a while because you're afraid that you might have to do something. You might have to extend yourself to this person. You might have to do something that you'd rather not do, so you just leave them to the wolves. But that isn't what this means. It means to act with fellowship. Paul considered the relationship between himself and the Philippians to be a two-way street with both parties actively involved in the sharing of both material and spiritual gifts. Isn't that the way all friendships should be? It, it should be reciprocal. And the really true friends that you have, you have no doubt whatsoever that if you are in need, that your friend is Johnny on the spot, they'll do anything that they can in order to help you. There's no equivocation about that. If it's monetarily, let's say you need $5,000. And you go to them and you say, you know, I really am embarrassed, I hate to do this, but I need $5,000, I need to borrow $5,000. If it was a true friend, one that you know would do the same for you, you don't even have to ask why, because you know it would be very difficult for that person to come to you to begin with. He feels humiliated, he's embarrassed, but he's in such a fix, he's got to have $5,000. So you get go get the $5,000, and you give it to him, and he says, boy, I, I promise you I'm going to pay you back. You say, hey, Whatever you, whenever you can, whatever you're going to do, I, I just, this is yours. You do, you know, that, that's your attitude. That's what your attitude should be. And let me add this. If you give it to them, the 5,000, they go, go away, and let's say you're, you're a man and your wife comes in and they, she says, well, who was that? Oh, that was so and so, won't know, blah, blah, blah. Listen, you should have kept it. Because it's doing you no good, nothing. It should be to where you don't, if, if you have, you're down to two coats for the winter. And this person comes in and says, I've, I've been devastated and I'm about to freeze to death that you'll take that coat, one of those coats, and give it to him. 
And maybe in some cases you take the code right off your back and give it to them. Then you have something that is eternal. Anything outside of that, you've wasted your time and money. So Paul considered the relationship between himself and the Philippians to be a two-way street with both parties actively involved in sharing of both material and spiritual gifts. When we give this, by, oh, by the way, this is a quote from Grace Notes. When we give to the church, missionary, or parachurch organization, we have an eternal stake in that enterprise. The Philippians invested a stake in Paul. They had an investment in him. Giving is an investment in eternal values. You hear that? Investment in something that is eternal. But that's only when you do it with the right attitude. When you do it willingly, when you're eager to do it, then it has eternal value. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, and verses 13 through 14. Now we're getting some input on how to handle our finances. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians, and when he says, if we, you see the we there, he's referring to himself, and the party that was going along with him, his, his entourage made up of believers who were learning and being trained by the Apostle Paul. So he says, if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we should reap material things from you? And then I skip verse uh, 12 because... It really uh, didn't have anything to further this. It would be a distraction. It's, it's, it's a fine, but I just didn't want to distract us with it. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share with the altar? Do you all understand what that's talking about? Those who would uh, perform the sacred services were the priests, and they would get food from the temple, and those who attend regularly the altar, when you would go to the altar, there would be those uh, from the tribe of Levi who would be attending that. Because you have to have someone that's going to go through the ritual, maybe uh, tie the animal down and go through the ritual. That was part of their job. And so he's saying that these people have a right to share with the altar. When it says share with the altar, it's saying here you have, you have a dead animal. And they would get a share of that animal in order to provide their food. This is what came on earlier. So I'm just going to say, out of these three, I can wait an hour, okay, and shut down or restart. What I'm just saying, wait. You push the wrong button and you're, you, <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> okay, so y'all get that. Then verse 14. For also the Lord directed those who proclaimed the gospel to get their living from the gospel, from the teaching of the gospel. So these other are a little bit cryptic in the sense that they are, you have to know something about the Old Testament and the way the sacrifices were made and how the Levites didn't have any land. God didn't give them any land because they would get their means of support from the the work that they did at the temple and the altar and all those things, a portion of the sacrifices would, would go to them. But right in verse 14, he comes out right and says, see, the verse 13 is talking about the Old Testament and verse 14 is talking about the New Testament. And then we have Galatians 6.6, 6, that, that him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. One thing I want to point out, it does not say that you are to share in all the good things with her who teaches. You'll never see that in the Bible, ever, anywhere. And now, I want you to turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, because 
you can just look at this and see that this isn't like the other two that I read. We're going to go a lot further in depth with this. With these two verses right here, there is a lot there. A lot of work went into getting this to where it is a lot closer to what the meaning is than what you'll get in your translation. And you'll see why as we go through it. That's 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. I was telling Carrie today, most of the time the Bible is at least really close to what the meaning of the verse is. Sometimes they are not, and this is one of them. If you don't know the original language to go into it, you're not going to get the real meaning here. And it's important. It's so important. I, 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 at least four hours on this I spent exegeting. I don't know if you know this or not, but exegeting is a time killer because you have to do so much research and you have to compare. You have to go through. It, it's just an ordeal, but it's worth it. Because you're going to get the real meaning out of this, except from some, some of these words, as we go through it, you'll say, why did they translate it that way? And I want you to get as close to the actual meaning of this as possible. That's it's my job. That's why I spend the time doing it, because I want you not to just go through the surface. You're going to see when we get through with these two verses how important exegesis is. At least I hope, hope you do. So here we go, starting with... 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. We start out where it says, Let the elders... Now, this is controversial from the very get-go. The Greek word there is presbuteros. That's P-R-E-S-B-U-T-E-R-O-S. The fact that it's in the plural, for a lot of people, would say, well, see, this is talking about elders in the church. Because there are people who say... Instead of deacons, you have deacons, but the elders is, is a group of men just above those, and the pastor is just one of the elders. And that would, they would make their case for that because it's in the plural. However, what he's talking about here is the elders plural because there's several churches, many churches, see? That's why it's in the plural. He's not talking about one church and one pastor, which is what you'll see this is going to be talking about. So the Greek word presbyteros can be translated as the old man. That doesn't mean necessarily that it's the old man. Uh, Charlie was in the Navy, and he's, did y'all call the captain when he wasn't around the old man? That's a standard term. In fact, um, I, my dad and my uncle always called my grandfather the old man. And... I thought, okay, it's, he, he's the old man. It doesn't have anything to do with age. The captain of the ship is the one in charge. And this is referring to the way I see this unfold here is referring to the pastor. Because I think that God has one person where the buck stops. Not a committee, but a person. He's responsible for whatever he has charge over. And that's what I think this is. So we have let the elders, presbyteros, uh, my, we'll see later, this is pastors, who rule well. Now, this is a participle, and it's a perfect active participle. It means those who rule well, that action, that endeavor, what they're doing, have results that go on and on. That's how important it is for pastors to rule well. And probably if you have to sift it all down to the most basic component of why our country is in such a mess is because most pastors do not rule well. That is a huge reason why we are where we are. And that's one reason it's so hard to find pastors who rule well because they're few and far between. Then we have, be considered worthy. Let me put this together. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. 
Now, when I have it read up here, it means I'm going to go in more detail. So let's look, first of all, at considered wor worthy. This is one word in the Greek, and it's axioo, A-X-I-O-O. -O. It's a present passive imperative. So this is a command. He's commanding uh, that these believers consider those who rule well, that's the condition, they should be considered worthy. The present tense keep on con consider them as being worthy. The passive voice means he's the one that's going to receive this action. He's going to, when you consider him worthy, certain things are going to take place. He's the recipient of this, and it's in the imperative mood. It's not saying that you have any uh, n negotiable ideas here. It is a command. The word means to consider suitable for requital. You might not know what that is, so I put in here, talks, it means repayment. Or for receipt of something considered worthy or deserving. That's what that word means. Now, apart from that definition of oxyoo, how would you know just by double, I mean by considered worthy, that it was talking about in a financial sense? But that's exactly what that word means. And then we have worthy of double honor. So we go down here and we look at double honor. Double is diplos, D-I-P-L-O-S, L-O-U-S, excuse me. And the Greek is the adjective and it's gender, uh, it's the genitive singular feminine. It just seems, means double, just like it has here. It means double. But honor is the Greek word time, T-I-M-E. I know it looks like time in English, but let me show you. <clears throat> This kind of E right here is an eta. It's a long E, and you see it has the accent on it, so it's not Tim A. It's, I mean, um, yeah, Tim, uh, Tim A. It's Tim A. The accent is on the A. You see what I'm talking about? That's how you pronounce it. It's a noun, gender, singular, feminine also, and it means honor conferred through compensation. Honorarium. Again, compensation. That has a financial aspect to it, doesn't it? When I go to these conferences, the speakers there usually will get an honorarium. I, ne I never heard that word until I started going to these conferences and said, uh, they would say that these, these, these guys are going to get an honorarium. I, even the word honorarium, if you never heard of it about, uh, uh, heard it before, there's not necessarily any financial connotation to it. You think that, well, you're going to honor them. But, but you see this Greek word actually has uh, honor conferred through compensation. Again, you have a monetary aspect here. So let's go back up here. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor especially those who work hard. Now let's look, go down here and let's look at work hard. Work hard is the Greek word kopi, uh, kopiao. K-O-P-I-A-O. Now I thought that this might have to do with copious. Sounds a little bit like this. Copious notes. Um, but it's not. It's Latin. <laughs> But it sounds a little bit like cop uh, copious, copiao. It's a participle, present active. So it means that those who work hard should get double honor. And this, this, this is the work hard part. It means to exert oneself physically, mentally, or spiritually. Work hard, toil to the point of exhaustion, to strive, to struggle. Okay, let's go back up here. Now, I want you to follow me through this. So, so far we have let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor. You know what that means, especially those who work hard. So, working hard here, it doesn't say in doing what, but I added these words 
because in the context you see that they fit perfectly. Those who work hard studying and teaching, that is the, is the pastor teacher's responsibility. That is his job, is to study and teach, study and teach, study and teach, over and over. That is his job. If he is going to be faithful, then he's going to be studying and teaching faithfully like this. And a lot of these denominational pastors, they're out running around the hospitals, and they're visiting the sick, and they're going to the to homes and counseling with the people, all this. Well, that's not the pastor's job. That is the congregation's job. They have, if they have the time and they can, they have the means, they should go and visit people in hospital, and they should go, and if a pe person is having difficulty, they should go and uh, counsel with them or encourage them or exhort them, that type of thing. And if it gets to a, a boiling point, then maybe the pastor will stop in. But that's not his job. His job is to study and teach. You see, if he's studying and teaching, then he is training the congregation to go out and use their spiritual gifts in order to be able to help other members, other believers, or whoever they may be, while the pastor is still studying and teaching. That is his job. And so that's one reason I have those who work hard. It doesn't say what they're doing to work hard, but it is to study and teach. Now, and I have the New American Standard Version here, and the next word it says, and preaching. Do you see how it crossed that out up there? You're going to see why. Where they got that is, you know, they just stuck it in. This is a hard verse to exegete, but what I did was mark that out, and I work, I, I, what I added there, it would be especially those who work hard, and I just in parentheses, so you'll know what it's talking about, uh, studying and teaching, and then, instead of saying at, at preaching, I have the word or doctrine. Now, let's go down here to the word they have preaching. See it right here? The word there for preaching is logos. L-O-G-O-S. You know what that means. It's talking about the word. That's what logos means. L-O-G-O-S, this is a noun, dated, singular, masculine. And it says here, this is the number one there's, there's two definitions. This is the first one that is pertinent. A communication whereby the mind finds expression. Word. So the, 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 the word there is word. Okay? Now, let's look at that. Because this is, you, you just can't take this and, and dream something out. And it has to be in context. This is the only place in the Bible where the Greek word logos, which means word, is translating preaching. It's the only place. And when you first look at it in the English where it says preaching and teaching, you start thinking, okay, well, what's the difference between preaching and teaching? It's not even talking about preaching here, as we will see. The Greek word for preacher in the Greek is Keruz, K-E-R-U-Z. And the Greek word for uh, word, it should be for uh, preaching. I don't know why. Oh, let me, let me start over here. The Greek word for preacher is keruz, and then, uh, that, that's the Greek. And the Greek word keruso is translating preaching. See, it's, a, it's close to a preacher is kerus, and a preacher that preaches, a, a preach, preaching is keruso, that's K-E-R-U-S-S-O, and it's translated preaching 39 times. That is not the word we have here, is it? So it's not talking about preaching. That There are other words for that. It uses the word logos, which is word. Now, here's a few. I'm, I'm going to give you some other words here. Preaching. Let's get make, make sure we know where we are. Especially those who work hard, studying and teaching, and instead of saying, uh, using the word preaching, it would be those who work hard, studying and teaching the word. And another word for word that we use is doctrine. 
You got that? And I'm going to show you a few words where that will underscore that. You all have heard this verse before. In the New American Standard Version, 2 Timothy 3.16 sounds like this. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, and this word is didaskalia, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. However, look at the New King James Version that, that, that handles the same verse. And it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. We say God breathed. And is profitable for doctrine. That's the same word there. Okay? Didaskalia. Doctrine. So let's... Before you get mixed up here, let's go back up here and look at this again. This word that they have preaching, I just completely crossed it out because it doesn't mean that. So it says the word at, uh, and the word doctrine, and the word is logos, and we see that that is referring to doctrine. You've heard me, how many times have you heard me quote this? 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's, that's the way I, do, I, I talk about it. And this is the same word here, didaskalia. So, what I'm showing you here is we know we, this, this word here, who work hard at studying and teaching the word, or you could say doctrine here, and teaching, this word here is what we're talking about, is being didaskalia. It can also be re referred to as doctrine. So training, which was the last word in that sentence, is the didaskalia. That's D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-I-A. -A -A. It's a noun. It's a uh, it's the data singular feminine. I want to show you something else up here. When you're looking at your Bible and it says, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching, don't those look like participles to you? A verbal type thing, like it's an action. Neither one of them are. Verbs are even participles. They're nouns. They're not uh, verbs or participle. A participle is a verbal. It's in the verb family. Neither one of them are. It's talking about nouns here. So the, the daskalia is has to do with that which is taught, teaching, or instruction. So, I'm going to show you that it's not referring to teacher. Because the Greek word for teacher is didaskalos, D-I-D-A-S-K-L-O-S. That's the Greek word for teacher, didaskalos, and the Greek word for teaching is didasko, D-I-D-A-S-K-O. Neither one of those words was used, it was the word didaskalia. So it's not talking about a teacher and it's not talking about teaching. It's, re, it's kind of referring to teaching, but in a, in a different way as the verb teaching. Now, the AV, that's the authorized version, the King James Version, translate didaskalia as doctrine 19 times. Here it refers to the content of doctrine. Look at this definition. Didaskalia is that which is taught. What, is, what are you being taught? Doctrine. And the King James Version uses that word 19 times as doctrine. This refers to Bible doctrine that was learned and now is in the soul. Okay? Now, your mind, your mind might be spinning, and I've got two minutes. But I'm glad because what I've done here is what I'm calling 
the expanded translation because I could not make any sense out of this other than starting over and making the words, uh, reflect the words, what they actually mean, and this is what I came up with. Okay? And by the way, that's legitimate to do. If you have the, if you can exegete, then not only can you do it, you're required to do it. So this is, with the meaning of those words shown in this expanded translation, this is what it sounds like. Let the pastors who rule well be considered financially worthy of the honor of double remuneration, especially those who work exceedingly hard studying and teaching the doctrine which can be metabolized and, and, and utilized. Now, that didn't take me very long to read, but let me tell you, it took half the day to get to that point. And that, I think, is much clearer and more meaningful than what you see in any of your, your Bibles. Because those words, where they have uh, preaching and teaching, neither one of those are right. And people look at that, first thing that comes in their mind, well, what's the difference between preaching and teaching? And that, it's not even those words. How can you take the word logos, which means word, and turn it into preaching? Now I'm going to go over this again. Oh, I didn't finish the last part of this, but I don't have time. We'll pick up next, uh, verse 18 Thursday, and I will go over this, at least the expanded translation again. Now I, what I want you to do is look at your verse in the Bible, the way it is, and note how different it is after this has been exegeted according to the meaning of the words, okay? And you'll see the difference. I want you to listen. I want you to hear it. But I want you to see in some ways it's, you can tell it's pretty much the same verse, but it's different in a, in a very important way. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the pastors who rule well be considered financially worthy of the honor of double remuneration, especially those who work exceedingly hard. Let me stop there for just a second. Work exceedingly hard. It doesn't say what they're doing in working exceedingly hard, but from the rest of the scriptures, it has to be talking about what the pastor's job is, and the pastor's job is to study and teach. He is to cook a wonderful gourmet meal for you every time that he gets up to teach. It's a gourmet meal, and it's for you to feast on. And some of you, not just you, anybody any, at any church, it's the same way, aren't very hungry. Now, whether you like the food, whether you eat the food, is not my problem. That's your problem. My responsibility is not to feed you wiener, wieners and cheese. Gourmet meal. And so that's why I'm telling you this, because I know that's what is at stake here, especially those who work exceedingly hard. Hard at what? Studying and teaching. And then this is the word doctrine, where it is the, literally the word logos. So studying and teaching doctrine, and the only way I could understand to put this, because the next word can be used as doctrine as well, but it's not talking, it's talking about doctrine that has been received, doctrine that's already in your soul, doctrine that you, is, is, is part of you, is you, you can utilize. So, Teaching doctrine, which can be m metabolized and utilized. Isn't that what, what is it? What's the doctrine that you've already learned? Doesn't that describe it? You've already metabolized it, and you can utilize it. So there you have it. Well, it's this. <laughs> Whew! Took a long time. Well, we went a little over. Didn't mean to go over, but we did. So we'll go over, uh, we'll start here next time. Let's close. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and its preciseness. And it, it's, it's perfect. No errors. Nothing that anybody can point at. 
in the original, it is perfect. There's a few very minor, few flaws. Nothing that changes anything in any significant way. And we thank you that we can rely on this word. It is our owner's manual. This is how we learn how to live and answers all our questions. So we thank you for it and pray that you will help us to have that gratitude and thank you for giving this word and the grace system of perception. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.